Hi guys, this is Tim Queen, and today we're going to talk about the 10 lies when it comes to B2B lead generation and what you should do instead in 2020. Line number one, and this is a really big one when it comes to B2B lead generation, is you can buy leads or you can buy customers. A lot of companies out there make you believe they can sell you leads or they can sell you high quality leads. But basically what they are selling you is a curated address list with some data points and some phone numbers and email addresses. They're not selling you any leads. They're just sending you contact information or addresses. Here's why this is not a lead. A lead is someone who has been qualified to be interested in your solution. Someone who has a real problem that one of your services or products can overcome. And this person is aware of your solution. This is a qualified lead. If you have an address, meaning you are starting out from zero, there is no background information about you, the person knows nothing about you, you have to basically start completely from scratch. And this is the most difficult thing to do. If you have a list of addresses of random people who have never heard of you, you have to go through a lot of no's. You have to spend a boat lot of time qualifying those people, trying to get in contact with them. You're wasting maybe 95% of your time trying to get someone on the phone because the person has no trust in you. Just buying address lists will not help you in any way. You have to be able to use your time smartly. Now let's compare this. Let's say you have a list of completely ice cold addresses which have never heard of you. You might spend like Let's say 100% of your time on someone like this. But if on the other hand, you had used marketing and the person is pre-qualified and know about you, the salesperson might only spend to have to spend 10% of that time per lead. So they can talk to 10 times more prospects and can potentially close 10 times more leads and convert them into paying customers. So it's really important that you think more about how can you warm up people on scale, on bulk, so you don't have to spend that much time on the actual sales conversation than having to spend warming up each individual one by one on scale without getting any results. Now line number two is you can automate lead generation in any form. And this is a really big lie, especially on LinkedIn, you will see the following tactic is recommended again and again by a lot of people and it doesn't work. So here's what they recommend. They basically tell you, we're going to set up a certain filter. We're going to select what people do you want to try to reach. Let's say the CEOs who are working in a consulting company and who live in New York City, US. So, and then they're going to use this automation program to just scrape off all the search results they find on LinkedIn. And then they're going to send an automated message with a placeholder. It's going to be usually something like this. Hi, and then they pull out the first name or whatever the first name field is into this list. Hi, first name. And then they put in their sales pitch and they send connection requests to them. And some of the more advanced solo solutions will then send in certain intervals, follow up messages if the person is reacting or not. Sometimes they uh, schedule like five to 10 different messages in advance to someone to receive over like a period of let's say six weeks time and they are trying to automate the relationship building process. Now here's why this is not working. First of all, 99% of all people who are writing those messages are really horrible at copywriting, really horrible at understanding basic human emotions, have no emotional intelligence, have really poor English skills and it just sounds fake immediately. Everyone knows this is not a message meant for me. This is something you just copy and paste the template or the software is just sending out the same message to everyone. Again, there is no research done about anything about the person. And when people feel you're just treating them as a number, they're not going to respond. It's the same as if someone is going to a dating platform and is sending out Instead of like personalizing a message to one person, they just send like, hi, love your picture, call me, and then putting the phone number in to let's say a thousand profiles and just hoping someone will respond to it. Maybe someone will, but you're basically wasting 1000 potential prospects and by using this mass approach, instead of just tailoring your message, let's say you're writing a personalized message to just 10 profiles, I can tell you you're gonna get a lot more responses than if you are sending out one generic message, which is obviously 
sent out on bulk to a thousand people. So not only that, now you get a better response code, but you still have 990 people. You can still win as a potential customer, which you haven't burned because you treated them with the respect they deserve. So don't use any form of automation. It will not work. You have to put in the manual work. And if you don't want to do it yourself, then just hire someone to do the research about some of your prospects for you. So you get the data and you can actually write a personalized message for each and every one. Treat each person with the respect they deserve. Line number three is you can growth hack your way to success. And when we're talking about growth hack, I'm talking about a lot of things that are actually technically illegal to do. A lot of times I see people do all kinds of data scraping. They go to a conference website and they download the attendee list and then they copy everyone's uh, email address and they send each person like a, a bulk message again. Like they think they can automate the stuff. But the thing is, the data is coming from an illegal source. It's not collected without permission in any form. So if anyone is of those people makes a complaint about you, this might get you into hot waters. A lot of the growth hacking tactics specifically try to break certain laws, especially when it comes to privacy marketing, GDPR, or the new privacy law in California. There is a lot of things that you cannot do in the future. A lot of times they get away with it because most people never complain about this, but it can get you like a 10,000, 100,000 million dollar fine if you are doing it to the wrong person. So don't try to use growth hacking tactics. Think about the legality of your marketing approach first. There's a lot of things that you can do which are really smart, which are much more effective than growth hacking and spamming people one-to-one -one with automation. So try to focus more on things that you can legally do on scale, which are more effective than doing some one-to-one -one spammy growth marketing or growth hacking tactics. Line number four is a bit more complicated. It's basically about communication. A lot of times, especially in larger companies, they believe that each department can do their own thing and they don't have to communicate with each other. You might have a marketing department which is creating some nice, glossy looking sales brochures, and you have the sales department which is just doing the cold calling or calling up lead lists. Then you have maybe the uh, social media ad campaign team. You might even have like a Facebook ad campaign team which is doing their own thing and just creating some random ads. You might have the social media team, which is creating some organic content. You might have someone in the publishing department releasing the blog post. And there might be no strategy because each person has their own boss. Each person or each department has their own agenda. They're not communicating with each other. So you're not getting any streamlined results. So it's really important to have an overall strategy to get all those teams working in one direction. And there has to be inter-team communication at all times. There should be at least one meeting per month where the sales team is talking to the marketing team, where the sales team is giving the marketing team feedback, what kind of material they need to sell something and vice versa. The marketing team has to talk to the sales team to find out what are the most common objections that the sales team is facing on a daily basis so they can create marketing communication to get this question out of the way. So the next time some salesperson is getting someone on the phone, there is an 80% chance that they don't lo no longer have the specific questions because they learned about the answer through the marketing material. Now line number five is more leads are better. A lot of times people think the only thing that's like standing between them and having a successful business is to get more leads. They think just by getting more leads, they will magically increase their, their revenue and their profit and will all work out in the end. But sometimes you have to look at your own business first and you have to see is actually a product, is there a problem with your product? Is there a product market mismatch? Is there maybe a quality issue between your product and your competitor's product? What is the reason why people don't buy your product? Maybe it's improving your product will increase your overall conversion rates and you actually can make more money with fewer number of leads. So think about this. The number of leads is just one of the wheels in your big machine. Of The number of leads is just one of the small wheels in the big machine of generating more revenue for your business. 
It can be anywhere. It can be the quality of your product, it can be the marketing material. It might even be the personality of your sales team. There is many different issues you have to think about and don't focus just on increasing the number of leads. You might have everything else might be broken and you're just like throwing out more and more leads and every lead is going to get burned because the entire machine is not working. So you're just wasting money and resources getting more leads and instead of fixing the machine that would convert leads into customers. Line number six is a lead is a lead. Oftentimes people think every lead is equal. That's why they often think about just buying like a list of addresses and think this will suddenly improve the quality. No, the quality of the leads is much more important. The quality. Is there an actual need? Do they have the buying power to make something? Has this person the authority to actually sign off a contract? Is there a long-term partnership proposal or are they just looking for something small once off? It's really important, are they working in the same industry? Are they working in your geographic region? Do they have certain partnerships? What is going on? You have to really understand the quality of the lead is often way more important and makes a much higher impact than the number of leads. So really focusing on like what kind of qualities do we actually need in a lead is really important if you want to get more success in 2020. Now, line number seven is you have to stop following up after one or two communications. This is a lot of times, um, especially solopreneurs make this mistake. They don't follow up enough or they don't have the software which is reminding them to follow up more and off more frequently. Now, here's the thing why this is uh, really important. You don't know what's going on in someone's life. Oftentimes, people have 10, 20, 100 different problems to solve. And on a daily basis, different problems might be pushed to the top and then everything else becomes less important. Maybe someone is working on a problem which you have the perfect solution to. But the next day, their boss is telling them, hey, you have to focus on this one. And then this is going to push up and then is pushing this down. So now the person is only working on this. They still have this problem, it's still not resolved, but they're working actively on this and they're forgetting about this. So by you following up over time, maybe after three weeks, this problem has been resolved. But then they're thinking about, okay, this problem is here, but they already forgot about you. Maybe they just start a new Google search to find someone new who can solve this. So by you following up, you're actually pushing yourself back into their memory and saying, hey, yeah, I, see, I remember I talked to this guy, maybe he can do it. So you're basically accommodating people for their changing priorities on a daily basis so by following up consistently. And I said at least like seven to 10 times following up over like a two to three months period. If you're not getting the, the results that you want, you will sell way, way more in your business and the overall revenue and profit will skyrocket. Now, line number eight is your contact form should have the fewest number of fields possible. Now, this is a tricky one. The reason why you should have less form fields is, let's say, for example, you're just asking someone for their email address. You're making it easy for someone to get in touch because the less they have to type, the more likely they are to fill out something. If you have like a 20 page form, a lot of people will feel overwhelmed. They might not do anything. They say like, oh my, why do you ask me 20 questions instead of just asking me for my contact information? So my, a lot of people would have been potential leads who didn't put in the work to filling out your contact form because they felt it's too much work. But if you have too little fields, there is a different problem happening. And the problem is you will get low quality leads. By lowering the entry barrier, by making it very easy for someone to connect with you, you're also increasing the likelihood that people who have like not a real problem will still contact you. Now, why is that a problem? Because you have a limited amount of time. Your sales team can only make so many calls per day. So if your pipeline is still, let's say you're getting 10 times more leads, but the quality is like 90% of those leads are not qualified and your sales team has to spend a lot of time talking to those people, finding out if they're actually a quality lead, and then they don't have time to talk to the real people. So by including a couple of additional fields, you make it much more likely that people pre-qualify themselves. You will get higher quality of leads and then you can, the time spent for your sales team is way more effective because 
you're getting more conversions and those lead to more revenue and then you can hire more people for your sales team. So it's a trade-off and I recommend to ask specific questions which help you to identify the quality leads. Now, line number nine is you should follow up instantaneously. I know some people have those really elaborate contact forms. The moment someone is sending out a message, they receive a text message on their phone and they immediately pick up the phone, type in a number and 10 seconds later, someone is getting a call back. And this is really, really wrong. Now, there is a sweet spot that you have to find for your business between someone sending out a contact information and then they're forgetting about you. So you wanna get somewhere in between let's say like a day or two later, but you don't want to call them 10 minutes later unless you're writing this on your contact form, get a call back in 20 seconds or less. You want to give people breathing space so they have a certain expectations. And the normal expectation is that someone would get back to you within 24 hours. So this is a good number to keep in mind. You don't want to be the creepy person who has no business, because this is exactly how it looks. If you're giving someone like an instant call back, after 10 seconds. This looks as if you have nothing else to do than waiting for your first customer. So really don't creep people out, give them some time, just wait a day, maybe put a little bit of time researching them to make sure that they're actually qualified so you know when you're getting on the call, you know a little bit more about their business without having to waste too much time them explaining everything again. Now line number 10 is lead scoring is not important. Now, when you talk about lead scoring, it's basically creating your internal system for how you rate a potential customer. And I find this is one of the most important aspects of every business that I ever have been to. It's really important to give different values to each of your qualifying factors. For example, if your product works best for businesses who have more than 1 million in revenue per, per month, and you were dealing with a business which only makes 100,000, you might not be able to serve them as well as a company with more revenue. You have to really identify like what are the businesses that you are able to help the most, that you have the ability to help more quickly, where you are having a higher return on investment when it comes to investing your time and your service. So by developing a lead scoring system and consistently making sure that you qualify each and every prospect on all the different factors that are important for your system, you make sure that you spend the majority of your quality time of your best salespeople to work with your highest quality prospects. And spending more quality time on a specific prospect, this will make it more likely that someone is converting into a customer. So by spending your time wisely, on your best potential customers, you make sure that you have more fun, more time and more revenue and the highest possible ROI in your business. Now let me know in the comments, which one of the 10 lines do you agree with? Which one do you think I'm completely bongus about? Let me know in the comments, share your thoughts. Are there any other lies that people often tell in B2B lead generation? Which ones have you heard the most? Which one pissed you off the most? Let me know in the comments and make sure that you subscribe for more marketing and business videos.